David Livingston was a well-known 19th century Scottish missionary. He explored the uncharted interior of Africa during his ministry. The morning he left Scotland for the mission field, he gathered his family and read Psalm 121, seeking strength from God for the long, difficult journey that lay ahead. He said this, it is my desire to show my attachment to the cause of him who died for me by devoting my life to his service. I place no value on anything I have or possess except in relation to the kingdom of Christ. As for me, I am determined to open up Africa or perish. Well, history shows us that in large measure how his efforts opened up the continent of Africa for the gospel. David Livingston is a great example to us in that no matter how great the many challenges and hardships he encountered in his journeys, the all-sufficient power of God saw him through his demanding ministry. In like manner, every one of us desperately needs power to live the Christian life, whether it is being an ambassador for Christ abroad or here in Charlotte. How is your spiritual walk going? One of the greatest challenges for all of us is not to live on our own strength, but in the power that only God can provide. Many of us have spent some restless nights, maybe even early this morning, praying, worrying, praying some more, racking our brains, trying to figure out why God allows such severe testing to come into our lives in the first place. Well, maybe it's simply because God is trying to teach us through our challenges in life that He is enough that He's enough, that He's teaching us that we can trust and obey Him even in the valley of the shadow of death moments in our Christian walk, because our help comes from Him. One lady put it this way, when you have nothing left but God, then you become aware that God is enough. It's a great statement. When you have nothing left but God, then you become aware that God is enough. Well, Psalm 121 affirms that truth, that God indeed is enough, that all true help comes from the Lord who is our keeper. The psalmist tells us how he comforted himself and the Lord on his journey to Jerusalem to worship in the temple by sharpening his spiritual vision. So I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 121. As we look at this magnificent psalm this morning, Psalm 121, follow along as I read it to you. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will guard or keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Now, let me just give you a little bit of historical background here on this beautiful psalm. Psalm 21, 121 is the second of the 15 pilgrim psalms known as the Ascent Psalms or Songs of Ascent. David authored four of these songs, Solomon one, and the other 10, including this one, remain anonymous as far as the, the writer. And most commentators agree that the Israelites sung these psalms as they traveled together to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God three times a year for the annual feast of Pentecost, unleavened bread, and tabernacles. These songs 
were labeled ascent psalms because those traveling to Jerusalem traveled upward some 3,000 feet as they ascended to the temple to worship. This psalm recounts the strenuous journey and the abundant strength they found in the Lord because there were no paved roads in those days, only well-worn dirt paths through dangerous places. For us, it is a psalm that teaches us to have a total reliance upon the Lord's supernatural strength as we journey through our earthly life. So, beloved, no matter what concerns you have on your mind today or this morning here as we worship, this passage speaks directly to those concerns because of the marvelous spirit of a peaceful trust in God that this psalm breathes out from beginning to end. With those things said then, Psalm 121 gives us four divine assurances that God watches over us and keeps us safe. Four divine assurances. Assurance number one, we are assured of God's help. We are assured of God's help. Verses one and two, I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Now think about this for a moment. The psalmist has been traveling for days. He is weary from the long journey to Jerusalem. His feet are probably sore, his muscles ache, and he sees Jerusalem in the distance. Suddenly he sees the hills where Jerusalem is situated atop Mount Zion. And seeing the hills, he looks with great anticipation and breaks into song through the form of a question. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? Notice the word help here means support, guidance, and blessing. So he's asking, where does my guidance, my support, and blessing come from? It reminds me of King David's words in Psalm 70, verse 5. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. So where does my help come from? As soon as that question floods his soul, the psalmist comforts himself with the thought that Yahweh, his covenant-keeping God, has committed himself to provide that help. Look at verse 2. With a strong testimony, he says, my help comes from the Lord. He affirms all the aspects of help that he needs. Physical help, emotional help, and of course his spiritual help comes from the Lord. Notice he's not looking to the mountains for his help or anyone dwelling on those hills. He looks above and beyond to the Lord who made them. He looks to his creator for help. The only one who has the power to help him walk triumphantly through life. King David said in Psalm 62, verses 7 and 8, On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. He looks to the Lord who made the heaven, the heavens and the earth. That phrase occurs several times in these songs of ascents from Psalm 120 to Psalm 136. Why is that important? Because the psalmist is refuting the Canaanite religion of his day whose gods were identified with the mountains that he saw. And they worshiped there with all kinds of evil practices. And he understood that to worship the gods of the mountains or any other gods was idolatry. And thus he made it clear that he was not looking to the gods of nature, like the Canaanites, but nature's God. He was looking to Yahweh, the sovereign creator of heaven and earth, thereby excluding any claims by pagan deities. One commentator writes this, the thought of this verse leaps beyond the hills to the universe, beyond the universe to its maker. Here is living help, personal, wise, 
and immeasurable. That's our God. That's our Creator, the one who made the mountains. And here he is assuring us of God's help. Now let's camp here for a few minutes to look at some significant ways God helps us. So if you're taking notes, feel free to jot down these verses. I'll read them to you. We don't have time to flip to each one, so jot them down. But let's take a brief look at some significant ways that the Lord has helped us and is helping us as believers in Him. First and foremost, our salvation, right? Now, I'm going to quote some verses here for you, and you help me fill in the blank. Our, con- our, our salvation, Romans chapter 5, verse 6, Paul says, for while we were still sinners or helpless is the actual word there, or weak, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were helpless, dead in our trespasses and sins, Christ died for us. Now, we were reminded last week with Pastor Khalil's message from Luke 7 about the sinful woman in Luke chapter 7 who recognized Christ as the Messiah and came, bowed down and worshiped Him, anointed His feet, and worshiped Him because she understood that she was helpless. And Christ looked at her, though her sins were many. He said, what? Your sins are forgiven forgiven. We are helpless outside of Christ. So, first and foremost, our salvation. Secondly, He helps us each time we confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God helps us each time we confess to Him. He is faithful. He forgives us. He is helpful in our trials and tribulations each and every day. Psalm 46, verse 1, you know this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. God is our help. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. God is our help. God is helpful in our weaknesses. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Such a beautiful passage here about our Lord Jesus. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need, to help in our trials and in our weaknesses. Good example of that is you think of Paul's thorn in the flesh. He prayed three times that this thorn would be removed, but his requests were denied by God as God said to him, Paul, my grace is what? Sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Paul goes on to say then, for the sake of Christ then, I am content with weaknesses. For when I am weak, then I am what? Strong. Then I am strong. And beloved, He even helps us when we falter. And even in our Christian walks, do we not falter from time to time? We struggle. Like the father of the demon-possessed boy in Mark 9, verses 22 to 24, Jesus asked His father, how long has this been happening to him? And He said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, you have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, I believe. What? Help my unbelief. God is always there for us. Our help comes from the Lord, even when we falter. The point here is that the psalmist is saying is that God's help is inexhaustible. It's endless. He's always there to help us because He is the shepherd of our souls. Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd. He's always there. Isaiah 41, 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God is always there 
to help us. That brings us to assurance number two. We are assured of God's guardianship. Verses three and four. We are assured of God's guardianship. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. What does the doctrine of God's guardianship mean? He protects us. He watches over us at all times. He is sovereign. He is there. And he won't allow our foot to be moved. Now, it's interesting to note while a pilgrim traveled to Jerusalem to go worship God in the temple, the sliding of one's foot was a natural type of misfortune given the land of Canaan was so mountainous. People could slip, fall, and injure themselves. But notice the psalmist assures us that God will not allow your foot to slip. He actively keeps us from falling during our spiritual journey throughout life. What's the key to walk in integrity? Proverbs 2, 7 says, He is a shield to those who walk in integrity. He won't allow us to slip. He won't allow us to be moved if we walk closely with Him. What a great assurance that He's guarding us. The story is told of a mountain climber in the Alps who came to a dangerous gap in the ice where the only way to get across the chasm was to place his foot in the outstretched arms, the outstretched hands of his guide, who was a little way ahead of him. Told to do this by the one who was directing the party, the man hesitated a moment as he looked into the gloomy depths below where he would certainly fall to his death if anything went wrong. You can imagine looking down. Seeing his hesitation, the guide said, have no fear, sir. In all my years of service, my hands have never lost a man yet. Now think about that. If that man could trust in the strength of a human hand to get him across to the other side, how much more, beloved, can we trust the sovereign hand of the Lord who created that man? Our God says, I will never leave you, nor what? Forsake you. I will not allow your foot to be moved. Psalm 37, verse 31, the law of his God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. Psalm 55, 22, cast your burden on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved or shaken. God will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Look at verse 4, behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. What's that mean? That God guards us at all times. He never sleeps. And we can sleep at night with great confidence knowing those truths. He who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. God is ever awake, ever alert, always focused on what is best for us. He never sleeps. Notice the Hebrew word here, keeps, means he watches over us. He's guarding us. He's protecting us. It carries the idea of watching over and guarding so as not to preserve or save us from harm, like a shepherd watching over his flock. God's there. He guards us. He protects us. He's always standing ready to support us if we slip and fall into difficulty. Nathaniel quoted this verse in his prayer. As I have in my notes here, Philippians 4, 7, it made me think of Paul's words. And the peace of God, which what? Surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God will guard us. He's our guardian, the sovereign one. That brings us to assurance number three in verses five and six here. We are assured of God's protection. We are assured of God's protection. Five and six, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Notice he's using figurative language here to make the point that nothing of either the day or night can harm us because he's keeping watch. He's protecting. He's guarding us. And the word shade here is simply a metaphor for protection from the scorching heat like God raised up the plant over Jonah. For the psalmist, shade provided needed relief from the blazing sun because the dangers of sunstrokes in Israel are very real as the sun drains weary travelers on their journeys. The shade provides comfort in the midst of oppressive circumstances, and that is what God provides for all believers, all of us, comfort and relief. 
So think about that, even by way of analogy or uh, an illustration for us. Think about when you have worked out in the hot sun and you take a break in the shade with some cool water. It's relief. It brings you relief. That's God watching over us. He is our shade. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 4, for you have been a stronghold to the poor, a stronghold to the needy in his distress, a shelter from the storm, and a shade from the heat. God is our shade. He watches over us. Look at verse 6, the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Again, this phrase speaks of the Lord watching over us day and night. No matter what conditions we are exposed to in life, we have around-the-clock protection from God. Now think about this. Sometimes things are going well around us in our walk with the Lord. At other times, we're hurting and we're depressed. But in all circumstances, the psalmist is saying here, God's protection for you is sufficient. It's sufficient. Isaiah 26, verse 3, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Well, that brings us to assurance number four, verses seven and eight. We are assured of God's preservation. He preserves us. We are assured of God's preservation. Look at verses 7 and 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Here we see the promise that extends beyond the psalmist's immediate circumstances to cover his whole life to keep you from all evil, which doesn't imply an easy life necessarily, but one that is well armed. He will preserve us. Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. That God is there. So maybe you're here this morning, and you're a bit discouraged, and you're hurting because of the trials you're going through right now. But God promises you, beloved, that He will preserve you if you look to Him for strength. We must look to Him. After all, that's the main point of this psalm, is that God will keep us safe if we look to Him as we go through the trials and tribulations of life. We must stay focused on Him. John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus puts it this way. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have what? Overcome the world. Christ has overcome the world. We can trust Him. He is our great preserver and our protector. Look at verse 8, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Here he's using figure of speech again. Everything that we do, God watches over us at all times, in every circumstance, and forever. Moses writes in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 6, this, Blessed shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. God will watch over you if we look to Him. So these repeated assurances should help to calm and quiet our hearts. And we need to be reminded of these truths, don't we? again and again and again. As Paul says, nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. We need to be reminded of, of these things, that God is watching over us, even when we're going through tough times. The promise of this psalm is not that we shall never stumble, but that no injury, illness, accident, or distress will have evil power over us. That is, nothing will be able to separate us from God's purposes. You think of Joseph, you think of Job, you think of Christ, our own Savior. So what should we expect based on this psalm? What should we expect? Eugene Peterson puts it this way on his book on the Song of Ascents, his book entitled A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. It's a great title. The Christian life, he says, is not a quiet escape to a garden where we can walk and talk uninterruptedly with our Lord nor a fantasy trip to a heavenly city where we can compare blue ribbons and gold medals with others who have made it to the winner's circle. The Christian life is going to God. Go to Him. 
In going to God, Christians travel the same ground that everyone else walks on, breathe the same air, drink the same water, shop in the same stores, read the same newspapers, are citizens under the same governments, pay the same prices for groceries and gasoline, fear the same dangers, are subject to the same pressures, and get the same distresses, and are buried in the same ground. The difference is that each step we walk, each breath we breathe, we know that we are preserved by God. We know we are accompanied by God. We know we are ruled by God. And therefore, no matter what doubts we endure or what accidents we experience, the Lord will preserve us from evil. He will keep our life. It's a great quote. He will keep our life. He preserves us. So you may be thinking to yourself, Pastor Pyle, these are great principles and truths from Scripture, and they are. God is our help. He is our guardian. He is our protector. He is our preserver. But how do I apply this in my day-to-day life? Let me, there are many ways that we could apply this message. Let me give you a couple thoughts here by way of application. How can we find God's strength in the midst of your multicolored trials? Beloved, stay in the Word. Number one, stay in the Word. God's Word is our all-sufficient source of divine grace on our spiritual journey. If we are to know God's strength, I ask you to stay in His Word, read His Word daily, hear His Word. As our pastoral staff tries to bring you truth week in and week out from this pulpit, study His Word and heed His Word. Don't be merely hearers, but doers of the Word. Stay in the Word of God. Jesus taught us, sanctify them in the truth. Thy Word is what? Truth. Sanctify yourself in the truth. Psalm 119, verse 143 Trouble and anguish have come upon me, yet thy commandments are my delight. So even in the midst of our trouble and anguish, where should we run to our Creator? That's where we get our help. And where do we run to His divine book, the Scriptures? Because His commandments are my delight. Jeremiah 15, 16, the prophet said this, Your words were found, and I ate them, and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. May that be true of us, beloved, that God's Word is a delight to our heart and that we desire to eat them and to live for Him. Number two, secondly, trust in the Lord completely. Trust in the Lord completely. When the psalmist looked to the mountains, he was looking to his sovereign God who made the heavens and the earth from whom our help comes. And by staying focused on the Lord, on our Savior, we can stay away from trusting ourselves and worldly things. Trust Him completely. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He what? Cares for you. And you know this passage well. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Not some of our hearts, all of our hearts. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make our path straight. Do not lean, you see, on our own understanding. Let me close by quoting one of our senior saints here who I have great respect for, who she is sharing with us some blessings that God has blessed her with in her almost 80 years of life, as the psalmist teaches us. We may live 70 or due to strength 80 years. Listen to her testimony. Let's walk in her steps as she follows the Lord as well. I've been privileged with singing in choirs, teaching, and the happy position of being a Calvary wedding coordinator for 30 years. But most of all, I have been privileged with a growing understanding of the meaning of Scriptures, awareness of the guidance and conviction of the indwelling Holy Spirit, and of trusting in God's sovereignty, love, protection, grace, mercy, and forgiveness in my life for almost 80 years. I love the words from the hymn, in which Tim will be leading us in just a few moments, how deep the Father's love for us, that God would give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. That's trust. May that be true of our hearts as well. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for this magnificent song. Thank You that You are our help 
that you created the mountains and that we look beyond them to you, our maker, our creator, our sustainer, our redeemer and friend as we've been singing this morning. Thank you for these wonderful truths. Help us to apply them by staying in your word each day, by trusting you completely, no matter what we're going through here this morning. Yes, some of our marriages may be struggling a bit, but let us look to you and to work together to be reconciled to our mates, to follow you, to be obedient to you. Some of us have been fighting spiritual depression and other anxieties and things of that nature. Lord, let us look to you, knowing that you're our very present help in times of trouble. So we thank you for these wonderful truths, and we look forward to celebrating the remembrance of Christ's sacrificial death in just a few moments. For we pray in his name, amen.